desktop. And just before I, I, I dive into the content uh, today, I don't like to beat around the bush and take take a whole bunch of people's time. So uh, I like to just get right in, share some valuable information with you, uh, and then and then close it out. And hopefully you'll have something you can take away to make your business better. And so this is the agenda. Real quick, uh, here's here's what I want you uh, to know. And and for the record, this is not going to be a sales pitch, folks, uh, uh, whatsoever. This is about sharing information, once again, that PBMs typically withhold from their clients, whether those clients be brokers, TPAs, self-funded employers, unions, you name it. We have them represented on this webinar today, typically withheld from their clients in an attempt to keep more dollars for themselves. And we're going to start to bust open that, that black box a little bit here today as much as we can in 35, uh, 40 minutes tops. Here's what I want you to know about me. Uh, I've worked for a drug manufacturer. In that role, uh, or in one of the roles, uh, when I spent time at Eli Lilly, I was charged with negotiating with PBMs to get our branded products onto the PBMs formulary by way of rebates. I've owned a mail order pharmacy licensed in all 50 states. I did that when I departed Eli Lilly. Becoming frustrated with the small reimbursements coming back from PBMs and the strong arming from the big three wholesalers in terms of what we were paying to get products onto our shelves and the requirement to purchase 80%. When we entered into one of those master agreements with the wholesalers, they required us to purchase 80, 85% of our products from them. And in some cases, they inflated those costs because we were stuck. And that's consistent. Uh, pretty much with any buyer uh, uh, other than a chain with a, uh, with a drug wholesaler. Becoming frustrated with that, I said, you know what? Need to have a little bit more control. Uh, and when I get it, I'm going to do things the right way. So I cashed out of that, that mail order pharmacy in 2010, right when specialty drugs were about to take off and started at that time was the first fiduciary model PBM. I say all that to say, I know a little bit about what I'm talking about. And I'm not gonna withhold anything th that I know from anyone who wants to listen, okay? If you have any questions for me, uh, there's a couple ways you can get those questions to me. You can send them to me via chat. You can see that here. Uh, uh, that option here on your control on your control panel, or everyone's muted for obvious reasons. You can raise your hand. There's a raise hand feature on your control panel as well. And then at that point, I will unmute you and give you the floor, and we can have a back and forth. Whether you agree or disagree, let's have that conversation. If you have a point to make or a question uh, to raise, let's have that conversation. Everyone wins whether you agree or disagree with anything that I'm going to share with you. Now, real quick, I want to test out this, this chat feature and make sure everyone knows how to use it. Real quick question for you. It has nothing to do with the content today. In your chat interface there, yes or no, do you prefer the presenter during a webinar to show their webcam? to show a video or visual of themselves during a webinar. Just real quick, send me a yes or no in your chat there. Uh, if you're indifferent or you don't care, type in, I don't care, I'm indifferent. But if you prefer uh, the presenter to show themselves on video during the webinar, say yes. If you, if you don't prefer that, type in no. If you don't care any either way, type in I don't care or I, I'm indifferent. Okay, uh, and I'm gonna come back. I'll get uh, I'll get a download of your responses after the webinar is concluded. All right, 
by the end of this presentation, I want you to know or have a better understanding of how PBMs generate revenue. And then when you get that information, I want you to feel something other than indifference. And then I'm gonna want you to take some sort of action. Don't leave here today and do nothing. The trend is clear. Pricing is a problem for self-funded employers health plans, uh, unions, also uh, uh, public sector entities as well. Whenever we ask the question, what's your most pressing problem around the pharmacy benefit? It inevitably comes back high price or, or, or something uh, more indirect, uh, such as transparency. But the solution that I'm suggesting to you today, and this is your first key insight. I got plenty more coming. The solution is not just bigger discounts or more rebates. The solution is eliminating information asymmetry. Information asymmetry is this. It's not my phrase. It's an economic phrase that says when one party has access to information and two parties are sitting at the negotiating table, one party has access to information that another party does not at that negotiating table, the party with the information is going to use it to its advantage. PBMs live off of information asymmetry because it makes it difficult to ascertain their service fees. In other words, their management fees. Let me give you an example. There's a lot in there. Let me give you an example of what information success looks like. The opposite of information asymmetry. I, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I, I'm still shocked today when I talk with a large group or a broker who has never seen in two decades a rebate remittance report. A rebate remittance report is simply this. It's an explanation of payments and it, it details what claims were eligible for a rebate and then just as important what amounts were paid by the manufacturer for each eligible rebate? When a plan sponsor or self an employer doesn't receive this information, that is information asymmetry because ultimately the PBM is going to leverage the fact that it knows how much each claim earned in a rebate and you don't. We're gonna talk about some of those implications here in a second. So that leads me to the status quo. The status quo and everyone, talk, everyone talks about how they're just sick of the status quo. Um, we need to do something different. And more times than not, it's just a lot of just a lot of chirping. No real action behind it. And maybe it's because they don't know what to do. The status quo says this. Plan sponsors enter into an agreement with a pharmacy benefit manager that calls for an artificially too low admin fee. You've seen it. Admin fee, uh, uh, 25 cents per paid claim, a uh, dollar fifty per paid claim, something equivalent uh, in that neighborhood, but it but it's based upon a PEPM or a PMPM. Sometimes a PBM may not charge an administrative fee whatsoever, and I'm just talking about on the pharmacy benefit. I'm not talking about for medical administration. I'm just talking about for the pharmacy benefit. No admin fee whatsoever. 
that essentially gives the PBM the green light or worse yet, a blank check to augment their service fee in the back end, back end through hidden cash flows. The bulk of that augmentation occurs through manufacturer revenue. It's easy for the PBM to do when you don't know how much each claim is earning for a rebate. I just showed you that. I just shared that with you. And some of you are listening to me now, you know, maybe doubting the validity or the amount of money that that could amount to not having that information. I'm telling you, it is not insignificant. No matter what people tell you, no matter what you, I'm telling you, it is not insignificant. The artificially too low admin fee, again, I talked about the medical administration. When a plan or a group foregoes pharmacy rebates in exchange for an admin fee credit for medical administration, it's the same thing. It's a it's the same game, just a different name. It is inevitably an artificially too low admin fee that is going to allow the PBM to fill in throughout the year an amount it needs to make based upon the blank check you've given them. On my blog, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, but there's third parties uh, apart from just me that will attest to after they've gone back in what it costs them to give up rebates in exchange for medical administration admin fee credit. Here's a second source. All right, so you know, I, I just don't put these things out here without having sources. And so when I worked with Eli Lilly, it was in this time frame here. It was small molecule brand drugs where PBMs were generating uh, their service fees from rebates. And then you got smart. You cut that off. What did PBMs do? They shifted, shifted it. Remember, mandatory mail order? Didn't seem that long ago, but it actually was. Remember mand mandatory mail order, and then now legislation and you know was written that prevented prevented uh, forcing members to go go through mail order, and and, and groups kind of said no. And then what happened? PBMs shifted that cost uh, here to specialty drugs. I just showed you in the previous slide, 47% of the profit was coming from, from, from manufacturer revenue or rebates. And now you're getting smarter in, in recouping more of those rebate dollars in your contract language. And PBMs have already started to shift that cost. And now that cost is being shifted to medical benefit drug claims. Prescription drugs on the medical side, as far as uh, PBMs concern, are concerned, is the wild, wild west. D there's little to no oversight. There's little to no oversight. And so the, the PBMs figure, well, shoot, we've got five to 10 years before our clients get wise to what we're doing in this space. It may sound like I'm bashing PBMs. I'm not. I mean, for goodness sakes, I own a PBM. But my key issue here, P 
purely from the purchaser's perspective is the difference between the fiduciary model PBM and the non-fiduciary model PBM. The fiduciary, the PBMs charge a realistic and fair administration fee, making the deal far more transparent. When that happens, there shouldn't be any other cash flows, and generally it's a better value for the plan sponsor. The non-fiduciary, and, and, and listen, let's stop with this. Pass-through PBMs, transparent PBMs. Uh, uh, listen, my experience, I've, I've seen them all. I've seen them all. Best case scenario, most of those PBMs, business models are a combination of traditional uh, uh, or pass-through. They're rarely one or the other. They're usually a combination of the two. Depends on what you negotiate. But the non-fiduciary PBM, uh, and, and, and I only talk about two different models. Either you're contractually obligated to put clients first or you're not. That's really the bottom line here. And so with the non-fiduciary PBM business model, they charge a low admin fee, but that low admin fee is augmented. And I've touched on that already. We're going to talk about those three different areas there. But before we do that, it's important you understand the PBM business model. Because again, very smart people been doing this a long time. I've had these conversations. Um, and you know, they're just now learning that. Uh, as a PBM, unless we own chain pharmacies or a specialty pharmacy uh, or a mail order pharmacy, we never take control of the product. Most of the claims claims that we adjudicate through retail pharmacy, we never take control of the product. It's never an inventory. Let me start with the contractual relationship. As a pharmacy benefit manager, we contract with pharmacies to have sites from which products can be dispensed to our plan participants. And then obviously, uh, we've got to have clients to provide that service to. Those clients are third party payers. I've talked about a handful of them, self-funded employers, um, uh, unions, uh, public sector, uh, municipalities, cities, uh, counties, uh, school districts, those are our clients. States, if you're a bigger, large enough PBM, you, you may even have federal contracts. The financial flow, we reimburse or pay pharmacies for the prescriptions that they dispense to our plan participants. And then we bill our clients for those dispense prescriptions. There's at least two problems here. I'm going to say three problems. The first problem is, and you've learned that already. Stay with me here. The first problem is that the inflow of cash in the form of manufacturer revenue is too low. Manufacturer revenue, better way of saying, more transparent way of saying rebates. If PBMs are generating almost 50% of their profits from the manufacturer, they are siphoning off huge sums of the rebates, which means that their clients get less of them than they deserve, increasing your net cost. That's the first problem. The second problem is the outflow of cash in terms of the reimbursement to the PBM for the prescriptions that are dispensed here at the pharmacy, whether that pharmacy is independent uh, or it's owned by the, by the PBM, which raises a whole other set of issues. 
that outflow of cash from the third party payer to the PBM is too high. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But here's the third problem. And it is the biggest problem. Look who sits atop this entire system. You do. Your clients do. The money flows down from you. But you know the least about how it works. All of these entities here are leveraging your unsophistication in the space, your lack of knowledge about the space, your lack of access to information about the space, about your agreement with the PBM. It's causing you to overpay. That is not a knock. That is a, a, a problem identification so that we can fix it. The second problem that I talked about uh, was the inflow of cash. Uh, to the PBM so that the PBM can reimburse the pharmacies for the prescriptions that it dispensed. I talked about how that is too high. That's referred to as the spread. That's referred to as the spread. The drug pricing standard, which forms a basis for discounted prices, is referred to as the AWP. From a pharmacy perspective, on this side of the aisle, we refer to this AWP as ain't what's paid. It's artificially in play, uh, inflated, akin to the MSRP on a new automobile that, that, that no one pays. But then the second type of price, the MAC, which is, which is closer to the actual acquisition cost, but it is still higher than the actual acquisition cost but it's a little bit closer. This is an example of AWPs in the real world and what the drugs actually cost to put on the shelf. This is something I post on my blog every Thursday, or at least I try to, blog.transparentrx.com. I want to show you how spreads manifest. All right, so let's take a look here at uh, uh, levothyroxine. All right. Look at, and this is an old post. I don't update this in the presentation every week, but you can go to the blog and we update it, like I said, every week. So AWP prices can change like gasoline prices that fast, right? So, but let's, here's the point I'm trying to make. Look at the AWP here, 561.85 for levothyroxine. And I'm going to put that number here. And the, the benchmark is AWP, and I'm doing this with my mouse. All right. So 561 here. That's the AWP. Now, what typically happens is, you know, the broker or the employer, maybe their their G, their general counsel, they'll start negotiating with the PBM, and we end up somewhere around 80, 85 uh, percent uh, generic. Uh, discount, uh, a generic discount rate off of AWP. Remember, AWP is inflated, no one pays it. So 85% discount off of 561.85. So let's call that 475, right? And so I'm just going to round here. So we subtract 475 from 561, keeping it simple. I know this isn't exact, but Let's say that that the cost now, based upon the negotiated discount to the group, is eighty-five dollars. Most groups would be ecstatic to get uh, an effective eighty-five percent effective rate for generic drugs in terms of its discount. Ecstatic. 
Look at what the PBM is going to reimburse the pharmacy for that same drug. The cost to the pharmacy is $4. We've got to tack on a markup. Let's say it's 100% markups. The pharmacy's got to make money to keep the lights on, right? Uh, but let's say it's 100% markup. Pharmacies would take that uh, in a heartbeat. And if PBMs were actually paying 100% markup on generic drugs, uh, we probably wouldn't have had to have the Supreme Court get involved to say that PBMs can now be regulated by states. Because that charge was led by independent pharmacies and their trade groups. Right? That charge was led by them because they were getting underpaid, sometimes taking losses on claims. So the PBM now reimburses the pharmacy. You know, let's let's we can even factor in a couple buck dispensing fee, which is high. So let's just say out of pocket, the PBM pays 10 bucks. That leaves a spread of $75. That's if AWP is used as the benchmark. Now we know in most cases, MAC is used for the benchmark. But let's say that the MAC price was $15 to the plan. Let's say that the MAC to the pharmacy, right? Because PBMs have MAC price lists. They can have MAC price lists and often employ this. There will be different MAC price lists for, the, for their, their uh, self-funded uh, clients or their health plans compared to the pharmacies they reimburse. See, information asymmetry. Okay, we're trying to eliminate that. Let's say the MAC price is 15 bucks to the to the to the uh, to the, the the client, the PBM's client, but the MAC price to the pharmacy call for the PBM to reimburse it only 10. That leaves a spread of five dollars. The state of Ohio just a couple years ago, decided that it was going to pivot in how it evaluated both a PBM's performance or its proposal to do business with the state. That pivot called for it not to, to no longer use discounts off of AWP. Or, or rebates, which this particular slide doesn't even address. As the primary metric in how well that PBM was performing, what they decided to look at was, how much are we paying you for the service we hired you to perform? They started evaluating these numbers. And see, I mentioned earlier, again, the unsophisticated, right? That doesn't mean not smart. It just means lack knowledge, a lack of knowledge, a lack of information. The unsophisticated are just looking at that discount percent of 85%. The state of Ohio said, no, 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 no. We want to know how much money you're making because those discount guarantees and those rebates can be made to look good. They can be made to provide the optics that you want to see, but nowhere near driving towards lowest net cost. It just looks good on paper. The state of Ohio said, no, we want to focus on lowest net cost. 
And when they uncovered in one year, almost a quarter of a billion dollars just in spreads, just in spreads, they terminated the contracts because they knew that this quarter of this $225 million was the PBM service fee. It was the PBM's management fee. It was the augmentation I talked about up front. The PBM is going to try to entice you to a artificially low admin fee, knowing full well it was going to augment that fee aggressively throughout the term of the contract as soon as the ink was dry. And if, if Greg were here today, or maybe over a cup of coffee or a game of golf, a round of golf, he would tell you, it's not just this is information we've never had before. It's information we never requested or demanded before because they were satisfied with the discount guarantees and the minimum rebate guarantees, which the PBMs love when you do that, and not the focus on lowest net cost in the contract language. Not the spreadsheets, the contract language. So uh, two examples really, really quickly. I've touched on Mac list and duplicity. I've touched on rebates and self-dealing. We're gonna bring it home here, hang in there with me. Contract language leaves reasonable person to believe there's only one Mac list. I just said it. There can be multiple Mac, list, Mac lists. If the PBM is engaging in augmenting artificially too low admin fees and that loophole is left open, uh, where the PBM can provide you with one MAC list, but work on reimbursing pharmacies on another MAC list, that's what they will do. Your MAC list would be less comprehensive and less aggressive, meaning there will be less drugs on it, and the discounts for those drugs would be less aggressive compared to the pharmacy. You'll pay more and the PBM will reimburse less. Didn't want that. Contract language will give the sponsor the impression that there's only one rebate. There are multiple names and types of rebates. When a PBM says that you're in the contract language and Someone on, on, on this webinar right now, whether you're a broker or employer, CFO, HR business partner, whatever your role, someone on this webinar right now believes they're getting 90%, 95%, or 100% of all rebates coming back from the manufacturer or the rebate aggregator. But if your contract says, you get 100% of the formulary rebate, but the administrative fee is not included in that, and we get to keep that. Then you're not getting 100%, 95%, or 90% uh, or 90 of the rebate. The, the, the manufacturer administrative fee it's mutually exclusive from the administrative fee you pay a PBM for your claims adjudication services. They're completely different. But the language won't tell you that. Express Scripts sued Kaleo, a drug, uh, specialty drug uh, uh, manufacturer, 
uh, a few years back, about three years back. Well, they sued them before about four or five years back, but the information just came out maybe two and a half, three years ago. Because it believed it was owed uh, rebates by Kaleo that Kaleo refused to pay. Kaleo owed the money. They just didn't want to pay it. Express Scripts called their bluff. Oh, you don't think we'll sue because you don't want us to make this public. Well, they sued. And it's public information. You can go out on the web. You can find it yourself. But the point I'm making by sharing this with you is here are the formulary rebates. PBMs, we sit, we sit down with drug makers and we negotiate rebates. Um, uh, and and th that negotiation could include labeling those dollars using different names. I mean, what sense does that make other than if you're trying to hide something? Why would, why would you have four or five, six different names for rebates unless you're engaging in self-dealing? We should be negotiating with manufacturers for your benefit only, not ours. Formulary rebates were being dwarfed by the administrative fees. Don't let anyone tell you different. Administrative fees are, in fact, rebates. Manufacturers agree to a number. This is what we're going to pay. It's a hard number. We're not going any higher. And then the PBM says, OK, let's break that number down and let's put this percent in this bucket. Let's put this percent in this bucket. Let's let's create another bucket and put this percent in that bucket. In hopes that their clients don't address this. So the PBM, this is from one drug maker, a relatively small one for one drug. Evzio, one drug, in hopes that you don't address this in the contract language and the PBM is obligated to just paying either 100% of the formula rebate or worst case, less than 100% of the formula rebate, but keeping the administrative fee. It gets worse. It gets worse. You, you have price protection rebates here now, which dwarf both administrative fees and formulary rebates. This is the same lawsuit, folks. Price protection rebates say, you know, drug maker, if you increase X drug by X percent within this window, Subsequently, you must increase the amount of rebate that you pay us by a factor of X. You see, PBMs are playing chess. Far too many of their clients are playing checkers. I'm sharing this information with you because I want you to play chess along with them. Third type, you'll see it referred to as pay for perf performance or, or outcomes, rebates, but this has been going on for 10 years. You'll see it in some PBM contracts. It'll, you'll see talk of or language around clinical programs, things like that. This is what they're referring to. For 10 years, we PBMs have been negotiating either directly or indirectly through a rebate aggregator uh, around uh, paying for the performance of a drug. And in this instance, you can see here some of the metrics being used uh, 
to determine whether or not a drug is meeting the agreed upon goal. And if it is, if it doesn't meet that goal and fall short, then guess what? The PB, the manufacturer pays a rebate. <laughs> the manufacturer pays a rebate. I've seen a lot of contracts and I've yet to see one where either the incumbent PBM, um, maybe we take on a client, we see the incumbent deal, or we've been asked to play a, a kind of a, you know, white label consultant, whatever the deal. And I've never seen one where the, where the group addressed these dollars. The PBM does and says, these dollars you can't have. If you, if you believe this slide, the formulary rebates generate the least amount of revenue of the different types of rebates there are. And PBMs are only limited in their ingenuity in renaming these rebate dollars. So the bottom line here uh, is this. And this may be a hard pill to swallow for many of you. But the metric you must put it, and this is another insight, maybe the seventh or eighth one today. And you must be relentless in the pursuit of this and it won't be easy. And I'm not saying it is. You may have to make some assumptions to get to this number. But the metric you must put at the top in the evaluation of your PBM's performance or of a PBM's proposal must be how much money the PBM itself is making. The lower amount of money we make, the lower you pay. The more we make, the higher you pay. The significance of what we make, what we take home, and this is the brilliance of it. This is the brilliance of it. Our service fee, you also can call it our management fee, is hidden in your final cost. It's hidden there. J just wait for a second. Uh, I'm going to show you something. It's hidden. That is the that is the genius of it. You think it's high drug costs, and I'm not downplaying that that, that pre to offer a pharmacy benefit is inexpensive. It's not. But you think it's just high drug costs driving your plan spend? No. Before I get to the sledgehammer, real quick, 2018 CVS earnings call. The CEO said this. Again, public information. The CEO of CVS Health said this about their PBM and their profits. We underwrite contracts to overall level of profitability and many levers available to pull. I mean, come on. They tell you we're transparent. We're passed through, but you have many levers available to pull. 
depending on the preferences of the client, they know you lack the information. They know that you lack the ability to interpret that information at the same level that they do. That's what he means by preferences of the client. In layman's terms, here's what he's saying. We are going to make as much money as we possibly can. The amount of money that we are going to make is ultimately going to depend on how sophisticated or unsophisticated our clients might be. The sophisticated get close to net cost, lowest net cost, or they get to lowest net cost. There's no more savings to, a, to be a to be to be had. The unsophisticated pay for the big corporate jets, the big Christmas parties, uh, uh, w w w the bloated payrolls, you name it. That management fee that I've been talking about for the last 35 minutes, this is the formula for that management fee. As I said, it will not be easy to get to this number. You may have to make some assumptions based upon how transparent the PBM is. You're either evaluating or, or part of an RFP or is already your vendor. Think about this for a second. When contracts come up for renewal uh, uh, for manufacturers uh, that we've entered into agreements with for rebates or with pharmacy networks, chains, or PSAOs, pharmacy services administrative organizations, which is basically like a buying group for you know pharmacies, right? When those contracts come up, we re renegotiate them. and they're set in stone. We don't go back to Pfizer and say, hey, you know, we've got this large group that doesn't like what we did for them last year, can you do more? Doesn't work that way. No, it's set in stone. It's finite. Now, if you believe that, then you also also should believe that whatever we keep in terms of our management fee, if it is too high, you pay more. If it is too, if it is low, you pay less. What you're negotiating for isn't necessarily bigger discounts or bigger rebates, it is what you are going to allow the PBM itself to keep. That's the end game. That's really what you're negotiating for. So when you negotiate discounts off of AWP or, 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 or minimum rebate guarantees, it is the contract language that drives ultimately what we're going to be able to keep based upon what you negotiate. It is the contract language that drives that. What you are really negotiating for is what you're going to allow us to keep, and that can be calculated here. Our deals are done with drug, make drug makers. Our deals are done with chain farm, uh, pharmacies. Then we come to you, and you negotiate on behalf of your group. And if you enter into a, a deal that is not radically transparent at a minimum, at a minimum radically transparent, then you pay us more. Here's the new path. At a minimum, radical transparency. 
ideally a fiduciary standard. If people tell you PBMs can't be fiduciary, that's a lie. Best case, it's an untruth. Maybe they don't know any better. If that were true, then why are PBMs now putting in their contracts if any state, I'm talking big PBMs, put in are putting in their contracts if any state mandates a fiduciary requirement on behalf of the PBM, we're not going to do business in that state. PBMs are putting this in their contract because they know it's game over. You can't hide money anymore. You're going to make less and your, your clients are going to ultimately pay less. It's game over. So the new path says this, those PBMs are putting that in their contract because they know now that these have to be disclosed if they're making money that way. They don't want to disclose it because it means they're going to make less money. State of Ohio, perfect example. They're going to have to charge now starting $25 per paid claim and going up from there if they want to keep the lights on and make payroll. No matter how big of a company you are, everyone talks about, you know, profits are the most important thing. No, it isn't. Surviving is the most important thing. And the basic level for survival of a business is making payroll. I'm bringing this all home. Last year, we brought this company on as a client. And they came to us at basically $58 PM PM was, was their pharmacy cost. Last year, all in, we got them down to $23 PM PM. I'm on, I'm sharing this with you to show you what it looks like when the PBM is fiduciary, radically transparent. When I talk about bringing costs down, I'm showing you what it looks like. The second piece that I want to share about that is when you compare that 57 to the 23, that difference, let's call it $35 PM PM, that difference Between this and this, let's call it 35 bucks. Bank. Prime Therapeutics was paying itself at a minimum $35 per member per month to be Atlas Aerospace's PBM. That was their management fee. It's reasonable. They're bigger than we are. They get better rebates. They get better discounts from, from the chains, right? So their costs should be equal to ours, if not better. But let's just assume it's equal. Then why aren't they charging $23 PM PM? When I say if states require fiduciary language from PBMs, game over, this is what I'm talking about. You can't live high off the hog and all of a sudden the music stops playing and make up for that $35 extra PM PM you're charging. Folks, the, the $35 PM PM was higher than what the drugs themselves cost.
It makes me angry every time I say that. Listen, this is a drop in the bucket. But if you learn something here today, I asked you for three things. Know how PBMs make money. Feel something other than indifference about what you learned today and then to take some action. If you want to continue learning, this is an option for you. It's the only program around folk with a focus on pharmacy benefits that offers CE by all of those organizations that you see on the screen where we're not influenced by big money. Don't care about the money. I want to get it right. I'm wrapping up here, 60 seconds. Uh, I graduated from Michigan State. The business school was named after Michigan State. I went through college never knowing. Uh, th the business school was named after Eli Broad. He pronounces it Broad, not Broad. It wasn't until a decade after I got out of school, I was curious enough to find out who is this cat? Why is our school named after him? Well, come to find out, he's only the person ever in the entire world to be a founder of not one, but two Fortune 500 companies, Sun Life Financial and KB Home. He believes that education is the key to skyrocketing healthcare costs. He believes it starts there. So do I. Every time I walk into a car dealership, I'm uncomfortable because I know nothing about cars. Spending a good part of my adulthood in the state of Michigan, yet I still know nothing about cars. I walk in, I need a repair, and I'm uncomfortable because I don't know whether or not I'm going to get taken. I don't know if I'm going to pay for something I don't need. I don't know if I'm going to overpay. You know who doesn't overpay when they walk into an auto repair shop? Someone who knows how to fix darn cars. Or at the very least, someone who doesn't know anything about cars, who brings someone with them who does. I walk in with my chest out, my head high, trying to make that technician think I know something about cars. I end up denying services I probably need and accepting those I don't. But I want him or her to believe that I know something about cars. That's what's happening today in pharmacy benefits. I've spent months with very smart people who've been doing this for a decade two decades and are just now learning that they are walking into the car dealership with their chest out, head high, and they're going to overpay for something or pay for something that they don't need because they don't know enough about pharmacy benefits. If that is you, please get it fixed. Too much at stake. That's my time here today, folks. I hope you learned something uh, today, taking away some key insights that you can start to build upon to help your company get the lowest net cost. Or if you're a broker, shoot, uh, get a competitive advantage over the broker, uh, broker's firm across town who's me at the car repair shop. All right. Okay. Listen, I'm going to stick around just in case any questions come through. But listen, everyone be, be safe. We're not quite out of this pandemic yet. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Be safe. We'll talk to you soon.